Okay, so uh, over the course of the last couple of days, we've seen that delta H gives us the flow of heat as a result of a chemical reaction. Don't lose sight of that, that's enthalpy. Enthalpy is the heat gained or lost by a reaction. We've seen that there are four different ways to find delta H. We haven't learned the fourth yet. The first way to find delta H is using the heat of formation table, which I think you have at your desk. You take the products minus the reactants, that's not here. Um, we'll do that on this slide. The second thing that we can do to find delta H is use the bond energy table. The bond energy table is not as reliable as the heat of formation. Heat of formation table and finding delta H with that is the premier way to find delta H. But if you can't do delta H with either of those, the third way to find delta H is using Hess's law. Hess's law uses uh, given equations that you have to manipulate to add together to get the target equation. Practice those. I think you'll like doing Hess's law. They're not too bad. The last way to find delta H, finally we get to an experimental way to find delta H. The other three ways are experimental, uh, are not are experimental, are theoretical. Theoretical means that you find them using given values, not actually collecting your own data. Um, I'm on the wrong slide, aren't I? Yeah, I, we'll do that next. I believe that we did number one on this yesterday. Did we not? Did we take the baking soda and hydrogen ion and make... We didn't do this? I hope that's... Yeah, we did the Hess law example before. Okay, so we'll start here. All right. So given this reaction, sodium hydrogen carbonate, that's baking soda, reacting with hydrogen, makes these three things. You did this reaction, I don't know, a week or so ago. That was the freezer bag lab. You took a carbonate, added acid to it, and it blew up because of the production of CO2. Would you be able to find the delta H of this reaction using the heat of formation table? Yes, you can. Would you do that right now? Determine what the heat of formation is of this reaction. Yes? You don't have one? Does anybody else not have one? Uh, you know what, let's just do this together. Uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate, this is going to be in with the sodium set. Anybody see that heat of formation? What is it? This, by the way, Sonia, is in the appendix of your book. Uh, at page A20 and A21 in the end of the book. Hopefully you have yours. Negative how much? 948, thank you. Hydrogen ion. Uh, is a unique thing. Most ions don't have a zero heat of formation, but hydrogen does. Hydrogen ion is zero. And then we have the sodium ion. That one's not zero. What is it? Negative what? Negative 240. 240? Thank you. That's quite a bit for just an ion. And then we have water. I know water is negative 286. And then that's liquid water. Make sure you have the physical state right. The other product is CO2. CO2 is a little bit of a pain because when you look up CO2, it's negative 393.5. Forget the 0.5, just keep all your delta H values as whole numbers. Uh, so we'll just go with negative 394. The delta H of this reaction, therefore, is, uh, you know what, I'm just going to put the delta H over here on the side. with the delta H being total of the products minus the total of the reactants. I'm gonna let you do that and see what you get. Turns out to be a pretty small number with all these big numbers. I'm oh, sorry. Mm 
What do you got? 28. Positive or negative? Positive 28. Sounds good. Positive 28 kilojoules. Okay. Now, number two up here, we're not going to do. Find delta H using the equations. Uh, the, number two involves a Hess's law exercise. It was so simple that I decided, uh, let's not bother taking time with that. Uh, so let's just jump to number three. Number three is kind of like a stoichiometry question. When I do this and I take the products minus the reactants to get 28 kilojoules for the delta H, what is implied is that one mole of baking soda reacts with one mole of hydrogen ion to make one mole of each of these three. It's already a balanced equation. So this really means 28 kilojoules per mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate that reacts with it. So if I have 4.2 grams of sodium carbonate that reacts, should I expect to still get 28 kilojoules of heat? No. It would be less because 4.2 grams is less than one mole. If I have less than one mole of that that reacts, my, my amount of heat taken in, positive, so it takes in heat, would be less. 28 kilojoules is what it takes in if it's one mole of baking soda reacting. So the question is how much heat then would be, it's not released, it's absorbed because the delta H is positive, when 4.2 grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate reacts. All right? Here's how we do that problem. As always, with every uh, chemistry problem pretty much, the first thing you do is convert to moles. So 4.2 grams of NaHCO3, convert it to moles. Sorry, one mole, I've been doing this for about 35 years, I should know how to do a mole conversion. One mole of NaHCO3 over the molar mass, which is 84, grams. So that gets us into moles. 4.2 divided by 84 is a small number of moles. Now the next step, we want to know how much energy is involved with this. Do we have a relationship between moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate and energy? And yes, we do. We do have a relationship. I wanted to write the delta H over to the right side of the end of the chemical equation because the delta H really is a part of the balanced equation. It's a part of the balanced equation. Every time one mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate reacts, 28 kilojoules of heat are taken in. That's a relationship. So it looks like this. 28 kilojoules for every one mole of NaHCO3. Now if the coefficient were a two, you'd put 28 kilojoules over two moles of NaHCO3. So you can use the delta H term as if it's a term right in the, it is a term right in the chemical equation. So we can use the delta H as part of a stoichiometry problem like I just did. And so what's the answer to the question? 4.2 divided by 84 times 28. Um, 1.4 kilojoules. <coughs> you divide that and then multiply 28. You get 1.4 kilojoules. <coughs> That's it. Good. All right. Uh, I have... That's it for that slide. We won't do that. Yeah, the next thing for us to look at is the experimental determination. How do we actually measure what the delta H of a reaction is? It's a process that we call calorimetry. Calorimetry. <laughs> Metry means the study of, um, or the measure of. No, sorry, the study of is uh, L-O-G, like, or L uh, ology. L-O-G-Y is uh, the study of, like, biology and that kind of thing. Um, metry is the measure of. So yeah, calorimetry uh, depends on this law within thermodynamics. So we talked about the first law of thermodynamics. It said the entire amount of energy in the universe is constant. This is such a dumb name. In science, there was the first law, the second law, and the third law of thermodynamics. And then there was another law of thermodynamics that they decided they should make a law of thermo 
but and it should be the first one, but they already had one called the first law. They didn't want to change their name because they were established and, and published. So because they wanted it to be first, they called it the zeroth law. So dumb. But anyway, uh, zeroth law thermodynamics says this. When you have two substances that are in thermal contact with each other, if there is a heat transfer, then the amount of heat lost by one substance equals the amount of heat gained by the other substance. That's what the zeroth law of thermodynamics says. Really, it's another way of expressing the law of conservation of energy. Even that's what the first law of thermodynamics says. So, um, yeah, the amount of energy gained by the one thing plus the amount of energy lost, which is negative by the other thing, should add up to zero. So, we get this. Now, I'm going to cover part of this up screen shade. I know that you can see it on your iPad, but let's just look at it one more thing to uncover that. When we measure how much energy is involved in a change, we use a technique that we call coffee cup calorimetry. Literally, we take a styrofoam coffee cup, that's why we call it that, and uh, I normally will do these labs with two coffee cups, one nested inside the other, just to double the amount of insulation. Styrofoam is a wonderful insulator. It's so cheap, I love this. This is the lowest budget lab you'll ever imagine. We go to the dollar store and buy a 50 pack of these. And uh, <laughs> then we need an insulated lid for it, so we just cut out a box, right? And uh, these are the high tech, 22nd century technology here. We even have a hole in the top so that when we set it on, we can still have a place to put our thermometer through. I mean, only the best for Troy High students. So, uh, and then a very high quality thermometer as well. <laughs> Not a mercury thermometer, but, but it, it's really good. So this is our coffee cup calorimetry setup. The whole thing cost $2 <laughs> at the most or whatever. But you know what? Of all the techniques that we do in here, this is among the most reliable. Because that styrofoam is such a good insulator, it just happens and it's very cheap and it makes it so we can get really good data. In fact, in a little bit this hour, we'll do an experiment and we'll test how good our experimental results are compared to how good the theoretical results, and it'll make you smile. It works really well. So anyway, um, yeah, what I had on the previous slide said Q gained plus Q lost equals zero. Another way of saying that is when you do a coffee cup calorimetry experiment, you'll have a chemical reaction happening with water as the surroundings. Water will be the surroundings every time. And we talked about this before with what the definition of system and surroundings are. When we have an insulated container, like this is very well insulated, everything going on in the universe cannot impact what's going on inside of this cup. So the reaction will be the system. The water will serve as the surroundings. And that's all that we worry about when you have an insulated container. So the Q that we determine for the water will be equal to the negative of Q of the reaction. Now remember, Q of the reaction has a different name. When your system is a reaction, we call it delta H. So I'm no longer going to call that Q after this, I'm gonna call it delta H. That's what it is. This is a, uh, a familiar equation for you. You've learned that and you've used it. I hope that you're comfortable with using it. Q equals MC delta T, often called the MCAT equation by chemistry students. Um, Q for the flow of heat equals the mass times C, the specific heat capacity, how much energy it takes to raise one gram of something by one degree Celsius. That's unique to every substance. Do you remember waters? Who's got a good memory? What is it? No, but it's four point something. 4.18. Yeah, I don't know where 4.317 came from, but it's 4.18. 4.18 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. That's what it is. Waters is very hot. Metals have a, uh, every metal has a specific heat lower than one. And water is way up there at 4.18. So yeah, it's tough to change the temperature of water. The delta T up here is the change in temperature you would guess that. Okay, now with this, we're going to do an example problem. Take a look at this one. This is right from the book. It says in a coffee cup calorimetry, which we have here, 
we have 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar silver nitrate combined with 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. So what happens here is the silver ions from the first solution and the chloride ions from the second solution, they find one another and they make a precipitate. Now the formation of a precipitate is going to generate some heat. It's not always going to be exothermic. Sometimes you're gonna have a precipitate form that's endothermic, but this one is exothermic. What is up here that tells us that the reaction is exothermic? What is given to you that you know that it's an exothermic reaction? The heat increases. Yes. What heat? The, the temperature of the water increases. Anytime you do a, a, a coffee cup calorimetry experiment, it looks like this. You have your reaction going on in an insulated container with your thermometer in there. Your thermometer is reading the temperature of the water. So the reaction's happening inside of the water too, uh, but the reaction is giving heat to the water. That's what's causing the water to increase in temperature. The reaction's giving heat to the water. So the Q for the water is going to be positive. Therefore, the delta H for the reaction will be negative. It has to. One's gonna be positive, the other one's gonna be negative. So it says calculate the heat that accompanies this reaction. Um, it doesn't say calculate the heat given off because it didn't want to give away whether it was exothermic or endothermic. So it just says the heat that accompanies this reaction in kilojoules per mole of silver chloride. Now we'll get to that unit there. They actually specify what unit they want. But let's go ahead and do this calorimetry problem up here. So we have the law, the zeroth law of thermodynamics says Q for the water equals negative delta H of the reaction. This is rewriting what was up here. I'm not, I did change the symbol on it. Rather than calling it Q of the reaction, I called it delta H of the reaction. Uh, but it is what amount of energy is given off by the reaction. <coughs> now Q, remember, is to <coughs> defined as mc delta t. I'm going to change the q to mc delta t because we know those three values. So let's go ahead and put in our numbers there and we can determine what the delta h is. The mass of water, oh, the mass of water. Does it give us what the mass of water is? It does? How? Anybody want to volunteer what the mass of water is? What do you think? 50 plus 50, yeah. But wait a minute, it was 50 milliliters. Those are volumes, not masses. Daniel? Yeah, the density of water is one. That means the mass of water equals its volume. And that's something that you really need to hang on to because they're. this is out of the book. They didn't tell you the mass of the solution is 100 grams. Um, but yeah, so the mass of, because the density of water is one, the mass equals the volume. So 50 milliliters of this, and as long as it's a fairly dilute solution, the amount of the solute in there doesn't really change it or affect it. So 50 milliliters of this is 50 grams of the first solution, combined with 50 grams of the second solution. We do get 100 grams of water. So use that when you're given the masses, or I'm sorry, the volumes of dilute solutions, just change the milliliters into grams. So we have 100.0 grams of water. The specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then the delta T of the water was a whopping 22.6 to 23.4.8 degrees change in temperature. 0 0.80 degrees Celsius. So there's our MC and delta T for the water, and that's equal to negative delta H of the reaction. Multiply this out, we're only allowed two sig figs, and when you take 100 times 4.18 times 0.8, I'll let you do it if you want to calculate it. Jack? Three thirds. Three Right, that's the two sig figs, which is correct. So 330, the unit on it 
uh, is joules because the grams cancels out and the degree Celsius cancels out in the MC delta T. Uh, so we're just left with joules. So 330 joules equals negative the delta H of the reaction. Notice that I've kept that negative sign on the delta H of the reaction. Q gained equals negative Q lost. And that negative sign is there to make them mathematically equal to each other. Now, I'm talking about, okay, I, I have the delta H of the reaction. I do have a negative sign in front of it. Let's divide out the negative sign. We decided at the very beginning this thing was an exothermic reaction because it caused the water's temperature to go up. So the delta H of this reaction is negative 330 joules. That's not our final answer. Because the final answer, they said, Calculate the heat that accompanies this reaction in kilojoules per mole. I just have joules up there. Uh, and specifically, it was moles of AgCl. So with this delta H, 330 joules is given off when the amounts in the reaction react. But the question is, let's try to standardize that so that we can have it per mole. We generally take values and standardize them per mole so we can compare things to each other. How many moles of silver chloride were produced? Not one. Look at the amounts of reactant that reacted. You have to figure out what the limiting reactant is and then determine how much of the product is made. Can you do that? You should be able to do it without a calculator. No calculators allowed. How many moles of silver ion did we have? This is easy. You're given the volume and the molarity of silver nitrate. So the volume, you have to change it to liters, 0 0.05 liters, right? And then the molarity is 0 0.1. So 0 0.05 times 0 0.1, 0 0.005 moles of silver. And then the chloride, same thing. Same volume and molarity, so it's 0 0.05 times 0 0.1. Both these are 0 0.005 moles. So how many moles of silver chloride got made? 0 0.005. Yep. That's what we do with this number. We're going to standardize this to per mole. So 330 joules is given off when 0 0.005 moles of silver chloride got made. So 330 divided by that number of moles gives us what the number of joules per mole. Now it did ask for kilojoules, so you're going to divide these two and then divide by 1,000 again to get your joules in a kilojoule. You good? And what do you get for a final answer? Yes? Negative 66 kilojoules. Right. 330 divided by 0 0.005 gives you 66,000. And then we need to make that kilojoule. Um, so yeah, the delta H, negative 66 kilojoules. You may have um, rounded differently and got 67. I'm, I'm good with it. Anybody need a replay on anything that we did here? This is the, go ahead, Fiona. Is it dependent on the reaction or is it exothermic? The reaction was exothermic because um, the water, we were monitoring the temperature of the water. The water got warmed. It had to have gained heat from somewhere, so that was from the reaction. The reaction gave up. So anytime you have a calorimetry experiment and the temperature of the water goes up, it was an exothermic reaction. If the water goes down in temperature, it was endothermic. Okay? Anything else on this? Okay. No, neither one is limiting. Uh, yeah, the silver ion is 0 0.005 and the chloride ion is 0 0.005. Same coefficient, same number of moles, so they both run out. Yes? The temperature is always kept in Celsius for these? Yeah, we don't use Kelvin. We only use Kelvin when we multiply by temperature, but in this case, we're multiplying by delta T. So your change in temperature in Celsius is the same as the change in temperature in Kelvin. We don't need to bother changing in Kelvin. Yep. So yeah, and that's a lesson that we can just keep that in mind in general. Whenever you have delta T in your calculation, you can keep it in Celsius. But like when you have PV equals NRT, it's not delta T. It was just the temperature. That's when you have to use Kelvin. Yes. Yep. 
in chemistry it is, when you get to physics, they'll use kilograms for pretty much everything. Here's another one. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to take a couple minutes. You work this out. You have a 150 gram sample of a metal at 75, so it's a hot piece of metal, 75 degrees. That would be, like it would, it would be very uncomfortable if you suck your hand in because uh, it's hot. Is added to 150 grams of water at 15 degrees. 15 is just below room temperature. So you got cool water, warm piece of metal. The temperature of the water rises to 18.3 degrees. What is the specific heat capacity of the metal? So this does not involve a reaction. The metal is not reacting with the water, but the metal is giving some heat to the water. The metal was hot, the water was cool. When you put those two together in thermal contact, there will be an energy exchange. So the, so when, you, when that, uh, like when our time is up, just log back in and I'll, I'll put you back on. Oh, you guys all see that too. What do I do to, I don't want to click upgrade. Oh yeah, let's do this. Okay. okay, so anyway, the metal is up here at 75 degrees. The water's down here at 15. The metal is going to cool off as it gives some of its heat to the water. The water warms up and they'll get to the same final temperature. That always happens when you have uh, two things that are in thermal contact. The warm thing will give heat to the cold thing until they're the same final temperature. And then it's over. So what we have in this case, I'm gonna leave you to do this, but again, there's no reaction that happens. We just have one thing gaining heat and something else losing heat. So Q gain, or I'll just say Q of the water equals negative Q of the metal. W there for water. Q of the water equals negative Q for the metal. This is going on in an insulated container too. So that means if Q of the water equals negative Q of the metal, that means that M times C times delta T of the water equals negative M times C times delta T for the metal. If their Qs are equal, that means their MC delta Ts are equal to each other. And we're solving for, the question is, what is the specific heat capacity of the metal? We're just gonna solve for that. Hopefully we have everything else. Do we have the final temperature of the metal? Can we find delta T for the metal? We need its final temperature. Do we have it? What is it? 18.3 says that's the final temperature of the water. What about the metal? What's that, Harish? I'm actually trying to trick you on this. It's not 71 point anything. What? Um, You're sticking with it, Achute, aren't you? Yeah. Achute said 18.3 and I said, no, that's the water. And now you're coming back to me and still, you're still They'll sticking with it. They'll stay at the same temperature. They'll go to the same yeah. temperature. Yeah, yeah. Now, Harish, you're not that far off because um, I had told you that when you have something warm together with something cold, the warm thing is gonna cool off, the cool thing is gonna warm up until they get to the same final temperature. So their final temperature is the same. You're thinking that their delta T's are the same. No, their final temperature is the same. So that metal cools off by many degrees, the water just goes up by a couple degrees. That's fine, because water's specific heat is so much higher. But 18.3 is the same final temperature for both. Anytime you have a calorimetry experiment, both your system and surroundings will end at the same final temperature. Okay, so with that, take a moment and see if you can come up with the specific heat capacity of that metal. It's less than one.
Got it? Is something less than one? Point two four? Yeah. <coughs> That's right. Yeah. So we know the mass of the water. In fact, the masses cancel out because both of them are 150 grams. Uh, delta T of the water is 3.3 degrees. And don't forget to keep track of your negative signs there. And then it's 18.3 minus 75. That's our delta T for the metal. So yeah, the negative sign there in front of the metals, MC delta T, cancels out with the negative sign you get when you uh, do the delta T. So you get a positive value for C. You, always, you don't ever get a negative value for a specific key. It's always positive. OK, so that takes care of calorimetry. We do have one other example problem we can do. This one involves determining the delta H of a reaction theoretically, and then we'll see if we can do it experimentally. Now, I do have it reversed here. I'm going to do the experimental part last. Would you take a moment? In fact, let's do this together. The dissolving of sodium, not sodium, ammonium chloride. We have NH4Cl breaking up into ammonium ions and chloride ions. What is the delta H of this reaction? Can we look up the values and uh, have you tell me what they are? NH4Cl, and with the nitrogen set, negative 314, thank you. And then ammonium ion, should we grow up close to that? 132? Chloride ion? I should remember these the fourth time I've done this today, but I, I couldn't tell you. 167, thank you. Okay, so take the products minus the reactants. How we find delta H given the heat of formation values. I remember what the delta H is. Positive 15. The delta H is positive 15 when one mole of ammonium chloride dissolves, like 15 kilojoules per mole. Up here it says 8 grams of ammonium chloride dissolves. 8 grams of it dissolves. So and the question is, what is the uh, theoretical delta H when eight grams of ammonium chloride are being used? So we take our 8.0 grams, change it into moles, one mole of NH4Cl, Hi. high. You need a bucket. Yeah, and I, I was a failure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, two things. 53.5 grams. Okay, yeah, that's the molar mass of NH4Cl. <coughs> so eight grams, change the moles, and then that last conversion factor, we talked about that at the beginning of the hour, 15 kilojoules uh, and one mole of NH4Cl. So yeah, we have that set up. It'll be less than 15 grams at the end because eight grams is less than one mole of sodium, not sodium, ah, keep doing that, ammonium chloride. So what is the delta H of this reaction? If eight grams dissolve, it will take in 2.2 .2 kilojoules. It's endothermic, you see the positive delta H, positive 2.2 .2 kilojoules. Okay, now this is the theoretical amount of heat that should be taken in when we dissolve eight grams of ammonium chloride. Now, I have measured out eight grams of ammonium chloride. I have it over here. So this is eight grams of ammonium chloride. I'm going to collect some data here, write it down. Um, mass of NH4Cl, 8.00 grams. I have 
measure out some water. We're going to look at this. The volume of water is 94 milliliters. A chew? 94 milliliters? Bottom of the meniscus, the chew. What is it? 94. I like that, 94. Now remember, this uh, we're looking for, the, we need to use MC delta T, the mass times C times delta T. So 94 milliliters, same thing as 94 grams for water. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you told me that. I would have seen that she was gone. Uh, appreciate your helping with that. All right, there we are, Sonia. We'll just keep at this. Okay. So we got 94 grams of water, and I need an initial temperature of the water. So I'll put that into my insulated container. Sorry. No problem. Initial temperature of the water is, it should be room temperature, came out of the tap like without having it run. It's right on 23 degrees Celsius. But you, do you believe me? Yeah. Okay. So initial temperature of water is 23.0 degrees Celsius. And I'm gonna go ahead and quickly add the ammonium chloride to the water, put my high-tech lid on, and stir. There's that. Okay, as I stir it, there should be an exchange of energy. Tell me, now think about this before you answer. Should the temperature of the water be going up or going down? Why you say down? Yeah, the delta H for this reactor, the dissolving process is positive delta H. That means it's endothermic. What direction is energy going? From the water into the reaction or from the reaction into the water? From the water into the reaction. Energy is going from the water, so the water is losing heat energy. Yes? yes? And so let's see if you're right. The temperature currently is right about 18 degrees. So sure enough, the temperature is going down. Finally, Aaron didn't read the question wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it looks like uh, this is about done. 17 degrees is our final. But you, you trust me? Yeah. 17.0 is right on the 17 mark. Okay. So, we have T final of water it is 17.0 degrees Celsius. Can you calculate what the uh, delta H of the reaction was? Delta H of the reaction is the same thing as Q for water with the opposite sign. So when you find Q for water, just change the sign on this delta H of the reaction.
2.3. Yeah, 2.35 makes it 2.4. I knew I shouldn't have let it shoot measure the volume. Yeah, so we take mass times C times delta T for the water. That's equal to negative delta H. And we find that the temperature went down, and so the MC delta T is negative. That's ne going to negate the negative side there. So delta H is going to be positive 2.4 kilojoules. Now, oops. We came up theoretically with 2.2 <coughs> kilojoules. It should have taken in 2.2. Uh, our reaction here took in 2.4 kilojoules. Some of the hours today, it was almost exactly the same. Just by, like, in the hundreds, it was different. Um, but th that didn't count anyway. So yeah, that number should match that number if everything went perfectly. If uh, somebody else would have read the volume, we probably would have had better results, but uh, we're stuck with what we had. No, I don't know what, every hour has been, um, like uh, one other hour I got 2.4, and then one I, I got 2.2, and then one was 2.3. But uh, yeah, so our El Chipo equipment here works. It's very close, and uh, is it reliable? Yeah, I'd say it's good, reliable. Anybody have any questions about how it came up with the delta H of the reaction? Okay. I have one last thing. And uh, if you have been doing any of the homework so far, you looked at the homework document, and uh, it has questions from chapter 10. We haven't talked at all about chapter 10, and now today is the last lecture day, and I've got, uh, what, uh, six minutes to do chapter 10. Whoops. <laughs> chapter 10 has to do with um, adding heat to when something is changing physical state. It's on the next slide. When you have a temperature change, you can find how much heat is involved by using the formula Q equals MC delta T. However, when you have something undergoing a physical state change, you can't use Q equals MC delta T because during the phase change, matter does not change temperature. Like when water is boiling, the water will get to 100 degrees, boil, and it stays at 100 degrees the whole time it's boiling. Particles are leaving because the liquid is changing to a gas, so you get that evaporation, but the temperature of the boiling liquid water stays at 100 degrees. So, uh, give me a second to get rid of this. Oh. So I'm going to put a graph up on the board that you will remember from Chem 1. I know that everybody who took Chem 1 here last year saw this. When you have a solid that you're heating up, add heat to the solid and it will increase in temperature. Okay, I'll put heat there in the x-axis. So once the solid gets to its melting point, it starts to melt and it becomes a liquid. It doesn't become liquid instantly. There's a process here. It undergoes a change that has that happen on its graph. During that, what's that? Uh-huh. You've seen that before. During that phase change, when it's going from solid to liquid, the temperature is staying constant. Once it's all changed to liquid, then the temperature can start going up again. So this would be the liquid part. Now, after it has gone through the entire liquid phase, then it starts to boil when it gets to its boiling point. The boiling process, now I'm not trying to exaggerate this, literally it's a lot more to boil the liquid than it is to melt. Uh, and I'll put the melt here and the boil here. During that boiling phase, uh, phase change, the temperature stays right there at the boiling point and just stays, stays, stays until all of the liquid has changed and then it starts to go up again when it's a gas, if you keep heating it. Why did the boiling go that far uh, in the, on the plateau where the melting was not much at all? This is not a mistake. Uh, it always takes more energy to boil liquid than it does to melt a solid, the corresponding solid. We're not changing phase or substances. 
Boiling takes more energy, not because it's a higher temperature, but because of what the particles are asked to do. When you have a solid, the solid particles are stuck in their position. They're, they're in a rigid arrangement, they can't go anywhere. When you add enough energy to get the solid particles to move and be able to move around each other, that's what happens during the melting phase. And, and so it, it does take some energy to get the particles out of their fixed position to be able to move. But then when you want to boil a liquid, you've got to get those liquid particles moving fast enough that they can actually break apart and break every intermolecular attraction that they have. So you're not really breaking the intermolecular attractions when you're melting it, because as a liquid, the particles are still touching each other. They're still condensed. But to break them apart completely takes way more energy. So this is the way the phase change. And so if we can com compare it with what we have up here, during the phase change, the temperature is not changing. So you can't calculate how much energy is being uh, used with MC delta T, because there's no delta T during the phase change. So we have two different formulas. One is for melting and one is for boiling. And they're very similar to each other. During melting, we find how much energy it takes to melt using the formula Q equals heat of fusion, delta H of fusion, times moles. Do you remember seeing that in Chem 1? You should have calculated it in Chem 1. For boiling, it's the same kind of thing, but Q equals heat of vaporization. So it's a different constant number times moles. Every substance has its own heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. Fusion, the word fusion in science means melting. I don't know why they use that word, but it's there. So when you see the word fusion, they're talking about melting. So the heat of fusion of water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. And the heat of fusion of, uh, not the heat of fusion, the heat of vaporization of water is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Look at the difference. I, that's why I made that mine so long for the boiling. Vaporization takes almost seven times more heat than boiling, than uh, melting does. Than melting. Now, I know it's about time to go. We're not going to have time to do this whole problem. But take a look at one of the questions in number 10. This is, this is like an outlandish question. They say... Determine the amount of heat required to start or to raise 500 grams of water from negative 20, which would be right here, all the way up to 250 degrees, which would be uh, the vapor phase, way up here. How much heat would be required to make that change? Well, it's going to turn out you're going to need five Qs that you'll have to calculate to do this. And you'll find the five Qs and add them together. You can't combine any of the Qs because solid ice has a different specific heat the liquid water does. So the problems will give you what the specific heats of the different physical states are. We will do this problem at the beginning of the hour Monday before we start the lab. Okay, I want to make sure that we can do this. Have a nice weekend, gang. Sonia, thanks for doing this. Good. Good. Now, you think, expect to be back on Monday, or is it too early to talk? I will say that. I talking, and I can't hear what he's saying. Sorry about that. Sounds good. I do understand if you can't make it. Just send me a note. Well, I'll know. I'll know during first hour. So if you're not there in first hour, then plan to Zoom during fifth. Okay. Okay? Thanks, Sonia. You have a nice weekend, too. Thanks.